My next guest has been hanged in effigy in Chicago. He was banned from Oakland by the City Fathers. Uh, he was uh, viewed by some people in Rochester as uh, worse th only than the bubonic plague. Uh, it's Time magazine did an essay on him uh, in which they said he's probably antagonized more people regardless of race, creed, or color than any other living American. Makes him sound frightening, doesn't it? But uh, he's, he's a brilliant organizer. Uh, he's kind of a legend. Uh, he, he calls himself, uh, he's written a book called Rules for Radicals. And uh, if the word radical scares you and you think you're about to see a man in a headband with a Molotov cocktail, uh, you should listen to Mr. Alinsky. Um, he uh, has found effective ways to bug the establishment and also to bug the new left and the extreme right and all sorts of people. Will you welcome, please, Mr. Saul Alinsky. How do you do? Well, you're just back from Korea and Japan, I think, uh, as I understand. No, all it, over the all, Asiatic. All theater. over Asia. No. And are you are you are you organizing Asia? No. What we? Well, I went over there to uh, look into the possibilities and see just what was going on. Yeah. And uh, you can't organize in most of Asia. One thing you do learn is to appreciate what freedom means back here in the United States. For example, you can't organize in Hong Kong or Singapore or uh, South Korea. They all have laws that if there are more than 10 people get together in a meeting, they throw you, uh, they throw you in jail. Uh, or in my case, you'd be immediately deported and asked to leave. So the only way you could organize would be underground revolutionary activity. The only difference between Hong Kong in terms of, of citizen participation mm -hmm. and uh, Singapore and South Korea and uh, Peking and Moscow is that uh, you might get knocked off if you start organizing there. Mm -hmm. you, get, you get put out of commission, let me put it that way. And, uh, and, so, and the others, you get put out of commission too. Instead of being put up against a wall, you'd just be put on a, an airplane and gotten out. Or other uh, tyrannical places, dictatorships like uh, Taiwan, same thing. Taiwan is a dictatorship? Sure, it's just like South Vietnam. But is Hong Kong? Sure. Hong Kong is a colony which has uh, straight restrictive uh, laws against any kind of. Uh, I know, you're British, and that's... Uh, I'm worried. I've been to Hong Kong. I didn't see any Well, you've been in Hong Kong in the nice hotels, you know, in the shops, and $75 uh, wonderful suits, and where most tourists are in Hong Kong, with those huge masses of the poor that are living over on the other side. Uh, they can't even have labor unions. Well, South Korea is the same thing. In South Korea, as a matter of fact, the labor leaders are on the government payroll. So can you imagine them leading a strike against their own employers? Hmm. I didn't know that Hong Kong was, was repressive. Yeah, Hong Kong is just repressive in a more sophisticated way, that's all. Yeah. You said it made you appreciate, uh, what did you say, the freedom in America when you see what you have over there? Yeah, you can come back here and you... You see, <clears throat> and this is a problem I have with my... Uh, younger uh, radical activists. I was going to say, how, did, how, does, love dearly. how does it strike Abby Hoffman or uh, Jerry Rubin if you tell them that? Well, both of them are good friends of mine, but I don't consider them radicals. I've been quoted in an interview on Rolling Stones as saying they couldn't organize a successful luncheon, let alone a revolution, and I meant that. Uh, but, uh, you said they'd be doing a vaudeville act in 10 years. Yeah, I said it, but I stood corrected by somebody who was closer to them than I am, that they'd be running a booking agency that would be booking vaudeville acts. Oh, I see. They both have, uh, they're much more enterprising than just doing a vaudeville act. Mm. But uh, I don't want to put them down. I mean, they, uh, okay, what's next? How do people hire you to organize things for them? They don't hire me. I, uh, they don't really have a company. I, I used to have a gag, I used to have a card that I used to carry that had said, uh, have trouble will travel, and, yeah. and I think that's what started that kind of business of hiring. Now, when we're invited into a community, mm -hmm. 
uh, that local community will pay the costs of the organization. Yeah. Uh, for example, in Rochester, New York, it isn't just the, the costs yeah. alone. In Rochester, New York, we were invited in after Rochester Blue in that bloody riot of 64, the one just before Watts, mm -hmm. the race riot. And uh, the churches came and asked if we would organize the uh, black ghettos and uh, what it would cost. Well, I told them what it would cost, but the cost is actually the actual operating costs of organizers of all the campaign, organizing costs, et cetera. And uh, I said we would, t uh, we would come in, but that we weren't like they were. Uh, they, uh, the church has missionaries that go every place, whether people want them or not, or whether they invite them or not. And we're, we weren't missionaries, and we weren't a colonial operation. And they had no business speaking for the black community. And until the black community itself invited us in, we were not coming in. And uh, of course, I don't, don't know whether you're familiar with it. Well, the moment my name was mentioned in Rochester, well, all the TV programs, you know, five minute slots every hour on the hour, and front page editorials, you know. Yeah. Walensky comes in, that's the end of Brotherhood Week. He said Brotherhood Week is a pile of crap, which is true. I had said, I had said it in, in a more direct sense than what I just said. Said it even said. more directly than you just no, did? No, you know what I mean. <laughs> and uh, what he's going to say to the black community is the only way you're going to get your legitimate demands is to get organized and get power and go downtown and and confront them with that power. Until you got the power, you got nothing to really confront with. And it's going to mean the end of our beautiful relationships with our black fellow Americans. They just had this riot, you know. And it was on this basis we went into Rochester. It's on that basis we'll go where we go in to organize us on the invitation of the community, not on the basis of money or any of that stuff. Maybe later you could tell us about your experience with, with, the, with one major company and how that illustrates your philosophy of how to work. I think of, of the Kodak company. We, we have to take a message right now from our local stations. We'll be right back. Sure. We're talking with Saul Alinsky, who has spent, I guess, almost all your life, uh, how would you put it, helping people get their rights? What is your credo? No, working with them to have them uh, have power. Uh, you see, if we're going to have a free and open society, uh, that whole uh, political way depends entirely upon people having power as citizens and expressing their power constantly. And uh, I'm not saying that democracy or a free and open society is a perfect society. It, it isn't. But I am saying that one of the things that uh, any uh, one who's politically literate, whether he's conservative or radical or anything else, recognizes that you make all value judgments including judgments on tactics or anything else, not in terms of what's best, but in terms of the alternatives. The alternative to a free and open society is a society of elitism, of dictatorship, of things like that. So if you're going to have a democratic society that has any kind of a future ahead of it, it depends entirely upon an active, constantly active, pushing power let, let me use the term that is so, uh, has become a cliche today, of power to the people on the thing. And every political student has always admitted that. And the only way people can have power is by being organized from the time of the beginning of time. Otherwise, they're just a voice calling out in the wilderness. So uh, this is what I've been spending my life doing. But it's been primarily always in the past with the have-nots. Lately, it's now at the uh, middle class sectors because, uh, because that's where the power is. See, uh, we happen to be one of the first societies that have, uh, has emerged preponderantly middle class. Uh, three quarters of our population are middle class not only in terms of economics, but more importantly, in terms of their own value identification. They identify themselves as being middle class. And what this means is that if all the blacks in America were organized into black power, which I believe is desperately needed, and all of the Mexican Americans were organized, and all of the Puerto Ricans, and all of the Appalachian whites, and, and other disenfranchised sectors of our population, and then through some genius of organization you were able to effect a coalition of those forces, it would be insufficient to have, in terms of power, to go ahead and get the, some of the basic changes that are needed. And uh, because the power lies in the three quarters of the population, the one that our, uh, that Greek philosopher down in Washington refers to as the silent majority, 
which was a term first used by Homer, incidentally, but he used it describing the dead, you know. Now, uh, so you've got to get sectors of those pop of those of that middle class population organized to have power, be part of you. That's the, well, you see it all the time. For example, uh, in the uh, farm workers, the migrant farm workers, uh, uh, the great boycott that went on for a long time, it was directed to the middle classes. Boycott grapes. Not the, not the poor, but the middle classes. When we fought Eastman Kodak, and we uh, developed this whole stock proxy operation, uh, obviously, uh, we, we of the poor didn't have the stocks or proxies. Most of our people didn't even know what a proxy was, you know. Uh, we had to turn to the middle classes for their proxies. And that's where the action Explain was going to be. Explain how you did that. How did you put, what, what did you put pressure on them about and what did you want to get done? Well, <clears throat> I have to give you a little background. The, the militant leader at that time in the black community was the late Malcolm X's right-hand man in New, upper New York State. And you've got to couple that with the fact that uh, about five weeks before Malcolm got it here in New York, uh, he was up in Rochester and he was asked about me coming in. And uh, he uh, delivered a, an accolade, said in spite of his being white, you know, learn everything you can, use them, and then split. Well, that was all right. That's always been my position, help to organize and then split. And so I was identified with this black leader the same way. And uh, what you had in Rochester was what you have in most American cities. The blacks in the community had absolutely no representation on anything, any decision-making body that had anything to do with their welfare, the future of their children. They had nothing to say about uh, police practices, the schools, uh, the poverty program, which was on at that time. Uh, any housing programs, any anything. And Kodak had the audacity to say that uh, when we came out with that statement, we want representation. Let me digress for a moment. Basically, what, we, what I've been involved in, what all this is, is still the carrying on of the American Revolution. Revolution never stops. And uh, no taxation without representation at that time. Uh, and keep that in mind because of Kodak's statement that uh, the blacks uh, have representation. We've got a Negro PhD on our staff and we put him on every committee to represent the black community. Well, that'd be like George III saying to the American colonists, I don't know what the hell the American colonists are yakking about. I've got uh, a representative uh, representing them. I appointed him, you know? Mm. And so the fight began. Uh, that Kodak was going to accept that representation that the black community decided was going to represent it and not whom they decided. You have to understand their mentality. For example, uh, at one point when I was asked, uh, how can I come in a, into Rochester, New York, after everything Eastman Kodak had done for, uh, of, and on the color scene, and when I responded saying, well, uh, maybe I'm uh, uninformed, the only thing I know that they've ever done is to introduce and develop color film. Well, the Kodak became very incensed at me on that uh, little exchange. And uh, so uh, we developed the, uh, well, in, in fighting, you know, you fight with what you've got. All we've got are people. On the other side, they had all that money and everything else. Was it during that that a man said to you, a black man said to you, I, I want to ask you a question, but I don't want a honky answer? No, no, that came oh. some years later. That was, uh, that was after uh, we went into a stage, which I could see was natural and to be expected, mm -hmm. of uh, what I would call color chauvinism, of where, you know, no matter what, uh, keep your distance. We've got, we do our own things our own way, which I, I respect. Uh, any meetings on strategy or anything else take place privately away on it. But uh, that's another scene. You want to get in that bag, we'll get into it. Yeah, we could. We, we have a message. We'll be right back.